Please welcome back Secretary Hillary Rodham Clinton and President Biosa Osmani, Republic of Kosovo. Thank you so very much, uh, Madam President. I love saying that, Madam President. Um, it's absolutely wonderful to have this chance uh, to talk with you here in Sofia. You know, our program today is about breaking barriers, and you have been uh, vocal and active uh, in pursuing your goal of breaking barriers, you know, not just for yourself, which you have done, but for women and girls and also increasing uh, entrepreneurship uh, and business opportunities uh, for women. If you could um, explain why you think uh, the advancement of women and girls uh, really is rooted in their economic opportunities and how best can we try to provide more of that? Uh, well, thank you so much, Madam Secretary, for uh, making sure that the voice of Kosovo is heard. And I would say also uh, making sure that we lead through the power of example. I'm so pleased to join you all here today on a topic that is so close to my heart and something that uh, so many in Kosovo, so many women well before me have been working on pushing forward. I strongly believe that empowering women, especially their economic empowerment, leads to empowering societies. So it's a cause so much greater than ourselves. Um, I have seen it throughout uh, these past 25 years that I'm, um, of course, politically um, involved, but at the same time as a lawyer, um, as a law professor, and as an activist, most of all, how the more we empower women and girls, the more that resulted in the prosperity of all of the citizens. Um, it has included, I would say, action on many fronts, but I would like to mention a few today, uh, given the time constraints. The very first one has been making sure that our economic policies are reformed and directed in a way that include the contribution of women in the labor force uh, because we have seen not just in Kosovo but of course as the data shows everywhere in the world that there's one simple way of making sure that we achieve economic growth and prosperity for all of our citizens and that is investing in your human capital human meaning including both men and women so if you exclude half of your women capital obviously also the economic growth will only be as half as much as you can achieve so it's not just the right thing to do as we've heard you say so many times it's also the smart thing to do kosovo unfortunately for way too many years has had a very high inactivity rate among women it used to be about 81 percent for many reasons both because uh, traditionally We've had a very patriarchal society. And secondly, economic reforms were not directed at including and supporting the entire uh, human capital. So the economic reforms were directed into incent incentivizing, one, the involvement of women in the political sector, because in that way you're, power of the uh, you're part of the decision making. In the parliament then, of course, the more women we have, and we have more than 30% right now, the more the laws and the policies that are adopted would be benefiting all of the societies. For example, of course, we have a legislative co quota, but we also adopted a quota for the board of directors in the, in the public corporations. Uh, secondly, that also means um, policies that support education of women, because education is another important aspect of uh, the economic empowerment of women. And thirdly, that means more um, justice or uh, more rule of law and equality because no matter how much you change the laws, if you have a justice system that does not implement them 
on an equal way, you will not be achieving the desired results. And let me give an example. We do have perfect laws when it comes to inheritance, inheriting property. But then in practice, that is being implemented only in 20% of the cases. Or uh, we do have laws and a constitution that is the most modern in, on European soil, soil when it comes to human rights uh, and equality before the law. However, we still have a justice system that needs to be reformed in a way that it tackles issues like domestic violence and so on in a way that the constitution and the legislation that is adopted requires them to do so. So there's still a very long way to go in order to achieve the economic empowerment of women. But one thing that we need to understand is that it starts with economic empowerment, but it's a transformative cycle. The more women are economically empowered by having good paying jobs, then they will have time, they will have the opportunity to send kids to kindergarten. If they do that, for every additional year that the kid spends in kindergarten, they will be more productive adults for the economy of their country for up to 40% according to, to statistics. And the more, uh, of course, women are economically empowered, the more they will be able to fight domestic violence because then they don't stay in a violent environment any longer. And the more that all of that happens, the more you contribute to economic growth of the country. So empowering women economically has an effect beyond their own individual success. It empowers societies as a whole. So it's in the interest of both men and women to actually contribute to these economic policies, as well as uh, you know, determining the societal norms in a way uh, that everyone can benefit from, from this empowerment. Well, I really appreciate the way that you made all of these connections because um, a lot of people uh, don't often do that, uh, that there is a uh, connection between economic opportunities uh, for women and the advancement of the education of their children, uh, something that is not often um, related one to the other. And the inheritance issue, the domestic violence issue, uh, those are all uh, impediments to economic opportunity and a move toward uh, greater uh, gender parity. Um, so you are looking at ways within your country uh, to uh, make these uh, advances. What are the obstacles you're facing? You mentioned one, the judicial system. And is it your opinion uh, that part of the reason why the judicial system uh, may not be uh, responding uh, equally to the uh, needs or the claims of women compared to men is because of the attitudes of judges? Um, or are there structural and institutional problems in that system and other parts of the country? Because what you're describing is not just obviously unique to Kosovo, it's uh, a, a, a much broader global problem. Um, I would say it's both. So again, we're talking about a country that traditionally had a very patriarchal system and that has been reflected in the institutions as well. So while we've been extremely, extremely sec successful in fighting uh, these um, uh, norms within the political system, and uh, of course uh, the society as such is, being, is becoming more and more emancipated every day, that doesn't necessarily mean uh, that the system in its entirety has changed. So the vast majority of judges and prosecutors that have been appointed were appointed for life quite some time ago. And of course, we work based on a separation of powers principle uh, where politicians cannot uh, change by themselves the system. So what we have introduced and have been pushing forward is a vetting system through which uh, judges and prosecutors were, would be undergoing uh, not just an evaluation of their performance, but also issues of integrity. And one of the things that I've been insisting on is that when we evaluate integrity, we need to check at how prosecutors and judges have been tackling 
issues of equality, especially gender equality. For example, if a prosecutor or a judge has decided on a case and used the, you know, that uh, usual uh, justification that we hear on cases of rape, well, it was her fault, it was about what she was wearing, why did she go with that man? Uh, then uh, kind of trying to justify the rape that happened, then of course that judge or prosecutor should not pass the integrity test because there's no justification to the violence and the rape that was used. Or if a judge decided to re release a man with 136 criminal acts that had been committed before and then he ended up killing his wife, well obviously there needs to be disciplinary, uh, disciplinary measures. Uh, towards that judge. So it is going very slowly, but we're moving forward in terms of reforms in the justice system. And uh, I need to point out that, I mean, when you have, no matter how many times you change the laws and you make them more advanced, it is very discouraging for women when they don't feel like they have judicial protection of their rights. Because even if politicians fail, because, you know, we come and go, there is one system that should never fail in protecting the citizens, and that is the justice system. They need to feel that even if we do an injustice towards them, they can find protection in the justice system. That's why it's called the justice system, because it has to deliver justice for all, no matter your, the, the gender that you represent. Um, and I think we will finally feel that our country is standing on its own feet and it's moving forward with steady steps the day when all of our citizens feel that that kind of protection is provided uh, from the justice system. As we speak in the latest poll, for example, the trust of the citizens among politicians is very, very high. It's almost 70%. But the justice system is very low. Nor normally, it should be the other way around because it's, it's normal not to have a very high trust among politicians. But I think uh, we need to continue working uh, so that um, you know, we have judges and prosecutors who understand that that is the only way to make democracy work and to have societies that truly prosper. Because as I said, unless men and women, boys and girl, uh, girls uh, both prosper, we cannot talk about uh, an entire society prospering. And this, you know, the more they feel that they can be, their rights can be protected, the more they will be encouraged to innovate, to succeed in business or politics or in education. And that will be the encouraging message that is sent to little girls. Well, I must say, I don't know any country where the politicians are at 70% favorability. Uh, well, Kosovo. Yeah, uh, you, you need to teach the rest of us how to do that because that's quite remarkable. But it's one of the many reasons why you recently were uh, given a very large uh, investment from the uh, Millennium uh, Challenge Corporation, which is an American uh, entity that supports uh, countries and trying to make uh, big changes. And so the MCC Kosovo Compact is the largest investment ever made in the energy sector in Kosovo. And, and a key component of this compact, uh, President Osmani, um, is frankly your efforts to transform your country's energy sector uh, and encourage uh, women to work in this sector. This has now been recognized and frankly rewarded by the United States because of your efforts as president and uh, the government's efforts. Can you tell us a little bit about how you've tried to uh, focus on the energy sector and what you mean by including women in a uh, reformed energy sector? Uh Thank you for, for making that point. In fact, uh, the MCC compact program, and, and generally what the MCC does, I think is one of the most important US programs uh, that uh, they approach countries that need economic support, but there are conditions. And two of the most important conditions are you need to show that you are a true democracy, and secondly, that you are delivering on rule of law. And when I say rule of law, that of course is in a trick, uh, it's absolutely linked to 
uh, you know, delivering on justice for all, gender equality, and so on. So uh, we initially started with a smaller program, about a 50 million program with the MCC called the MCC Threshold. And that was very much, among others, focused on educating young women in the energy sector. Now, for way too long, this sector has been kind of a men-only sector. And of course, we didn't see great results. Um, among others, Kosovo is very much uh, heavily dependent on coal. So as we speak, we're trying to transform our energy sector into sustainable uh, energy, green energy, and most of our investment is in wind and solar. But to be successful on wind and solar, you need battery storage. And right now, through the MCC Compact project, um, Kosovo will have, by 2027, so in another few years, the highest per capita battery storage in the world because of this MCC compact support. Now, when we were negotiating it, the battery storage was component number one, private sector empowerment was component number two, and as president, I insisted that there must be a women empowerment in energy component because that was the only way to involve all of the society and truly make sure that you use all of your human capital. So that has been included. And we strongly believe that as we did with the MCC Threshold pro uh, Program by educating women in the United States in the um, energy sector, and now they are all back really included in the sector, we will be able to create good paying job for everyone, uh, jobs in everyone in Kosovo and make sure that women give the kind of perspective that in most cases men cannot. Uh, but also take into account the benefits of sustainable development. Because while most of the men in the room in these kind of meetings will be talking to you about money, numbers, women always also talk about the benefits of all, the benefits in health, the benefits to raising a child in a sustainably developed environment, the benefits of innovation and how important that is for youth. And that is so crucial for a country like Kosovo because we have the youngest population in Europe with about 53% under 25. And of course, uh, a very young population will look for opportunities like this. And these kind of programs have really changed the economic environment in Kosovo. Now we have a much higher number of women seeking for opportunities to study energy law and all kinds of, um, you know, uh, scholarships in the area of energy and also bringing these new perspectives that are helping companies or the public sector grow. So I think it is uh, very crucial that the U.S. is supporting us in this endeavor. Well, it's a great example, not just of what's happening in Kosovo, but what needs to happen in other countries as well. I mean, the transition from uh, fossil fuels uh, to a much higher usage of renewable energy it's not easy. I mean, if it were easy, it already would have been done, and it requires a lot of different inputs. And one of them is uh, having a workforce that understands that, that knows um, how to deliver on it. Even in the United States, where uh, under President Biden, legislation was passed, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, to try to make a huge investment in clean energy, and also the Chips and Science Act to make another huge investment in advanced manufacturing, frankly, to compete with China on semiconductors and other high-tech uh, components, it was clear that you had to include women. We did not have enough of a trained workforce, men or women, to actually take part in uh, this uh, very new uh, economic vision. So you couldn't leave out women uh, and expect to get the workforce, uh, the talent that you needed. So I think what you're trying to do, especially because of your heavy dependence on coal and all of the, not just climate costs, but health costs that that uh, brings. You know, I really want to just, um, I could talk to you forever because you are doing such an amazing job in uh, what uh, you're doing. And I want to just mention quickly two things and have you comment on them. Um, one is that you now are among the very first um, uh, country that I'm aware of to take on the issue of online violence against women. This is a huge problem, but because it happens online, many people don't know about it, and they don't know about the constant harassment and threats against women in politics, in government, in business, 
in entertainment, every walk of life. You have taken that on, and I, I would really appreciate your telling us about how you're trying to track and reduce the online violence. And then last month, you convened uh, the International Forum on Women, Peace, and Security um, that looked at a number of issues, climate security, but also conflict-related uh, violence against women. So as we wrap up, uh, President Osmani, if you could perhaps address both of those. These are global problems, but once again, you're in the lead in both recognizing them, talking about them publicly, which is not common, and then trying to address them. Um, absolutely. I think raising your voice publicly uh, is key. And of course, we haven't resolved this problem. Quite the opposite. The more technology is advancing, the more online hate, online hate speech is also advancing. But what we're doing is, and, and of course this is not just me, but so many women in politics, civil society, women in the media, we're raising our voice and in a positive way pressuring security and justice institutions to immediately take action in these kind of cases. Because if we don't, there's a pattern. Those who start threatening you online um, and then nothing happens, that means emboldening them and then they do it again and again and again and at some point, it's not just online any longer, it turns into physical uh, violence. So we've been taking this on by one, publicly speaking about it and encouraging institutions to immediately act on this. Uh, and secondly, uh, making sure that within the security and justice system, there are specific departments uh, that are uh, trained to deal with this and then uh, efficiently dealing with this. Now I've proposed that within the police we have a specific department dealing with online hate speech and online violence only because in this way uh, we can get to the preventive action uh, that we truly need in our societies. Uh, secondly, when it comes to the International uh, Forum on Women, Peace and Security, I think you know the example of Kosovo is WPS in action. Uh, whether it's about during our peaceful resistance or about uh, our armed resistance and then the peace building process and then the state building process and finally the democracy building process, women in Kosovo have been at the forefront of it. Um, and this year's uh, forum, for which I want to thank you for, for uh, uh, sending a video that meant so much to all of the thousands of participants, um, has shown one of the biggest problems that we have on women's participation and women peace and security uh, processes is the fact that there are so many conflicts around the world and um, uh, with survivors of sexual violence around the world we decided as Kosovo to make sure that we invite them from all over the, the, the globe and showcase the fact that we've built the strongest support system that exists right now for rape survivors. Um, as we see, even, even right now, rape is being used as a tool of war, is the most horrendous tool of war. And during the Milosevic genocidal regime, there were about 20,000 women that were raped in Kosovo. But we've managed to build a support system that fights the stigma and empowers them because it's so crucial that they're not just survivors, but they are survivors who thrive. And they have been thriving, not just within the country, but they are sharing the example of thriving and you know, turning pain into strength all around the world. And these champions, these heroines, they have been going to Ukraine, to the Middle East, to Africa, to empower uh, other survivors of sexual violence during the war. We also tackled climate security um, in this summit because women are those women and girls are those who are mostly affected So we need to treat climate security as part of the women peace and security agenda But as a final point madam secretary in order for women to be empowered Peace is a precondition unless you have peace in your country Unless you live in a stable country unless you have freedom to begin with you will never be able to economically prosper so let me take this moment, and I know you've heard this a thousand times or a million times from the people of Kosovo, to express the gratitude of the people of Kosovo to you, to President Clinton, and all the American people for giving the people of Kosovo just that, 
freedom, peace, and democracy. Without that, we would have never been able to talk about economic prosperity, about equality, or just have the chance to fight for it. So let's join forces to help all those around the world who need a helping hand now. Kosovo right now is a thriving democracy, a thriving economy, and a testament to what democracies can achieve when they stand together united against tyrannies and against genocidal regimes. And now we absolutely welcome the chance to, to give back. Let's uh, express our appreciation to President Osmani for today and for every day. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's been an honor. Thank you, everyone.